So welcome everyone to the Distilled Spirits Council Ask the Experts webinar series. Um, today our topic is the science of flavor balancing, uh, unlocking new possibilities for distilleries and beverage alcohol. I'm Amy Carter. I'm the Vice President of Member Services and Business Development at the Distilled Spirits Council of the US, also known as DISCUS. I'm gonna introduce our speakers in just a second. But before we do that, I want to let everyone know that we are recording this webinar um, so that it will be available on the events page of the Discus website, as well as our YouTube channel. And then I also want to remind everyone of our the Discus Antitrust Policy Statement, which is to be mindful and refrain from discussions or exchanging information relating to pricing, marketing or sales plans, cost or confidential plans regarding output or production, boycotting another company, not recruiting or hiring um, other employees or salaries or wages or benefits or any other competitively sensitive or proprietary business information. So uh, with that sort of housekeeping out of the way, I just wanna share with folks that if you're not familiar with Discus, we are the leading voice and advocate for our members and also for the broader distilled, industry, distilled spirits industry. We provide a wealth of resources, and services, including this webinar, that aim to educate and share relevant trends, ideas, um, discussions, and opportunities, not only with our members, but also with others that are interested in distilled spirits. Um, this Ask the Expert webinar series has included, uh, recent webinars have included topics like the rise of agave spirits, um, small business grants for export activities, uh, trends in the US liquor market that was featuring Nielsen IQ, um, e-commerce with Reserve Bar and direct-to-consumer e-commerce with uh, Flaviar, which was previously named Speakeasy. Uh, we've had global regulatory compliance tips from Trace One, tips for accessing capital and expertise with Pronghorn and some industry experts, and also a discussion on the alcohol buying trends of socially conscious consumers with Women of the Vine and Spirits. So you see there's a wide range of topics. Um, we're always interested in anything that people want to hear about. So if you have suggestions for topics, please feel free to email membership at, at distilledspirits.org. So with all of that out of the way, I want to welcome um, every our speakers for today's webinar, which again is the science of flavor balancing, unlocking new possibilities for distilleries and beverage alcohol. We've got Matt Rubin, who's the founder and CEO of True Essence Foods. <laughs> and we have their customer, Dave Colt who is co-founder and CEO of Sun King Brewery. Welcome, Matt and Dave. Thank you. Thank you. It's a yeah. pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Happy Halloween, everybody. Oh, that's right. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Where's the hat? <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I said that, too, in our prep club. I was like, I, don't be surprised if I'm wearing a little witch's hat, but I, I totally forgot about that. It's so nice and sunny here in the D.C. area that it doesn't seem like Halloween. Um, but in any case, for everybody, um, Matt, Dave, and I will have a conversation for about 25, 30 minutes. And then um, we will take questions throughout. So if you do have a question, feel free to raise, use the raise your hand icon at any time or put your question in the chat. Um, and myself or someone on my team will make sure that we read it out. Uh, we will also save time at the end for just general Q&A. So don't feel like you will get your question in. Um, we've included contact information for Matt and Dave on a slide at the end. So you can contact them directly if you didn't get your question asked or if you just want to contact them directly, um, or you can just ask uh, Discus and we'll, we'll connect you directly. We're and pretty then, nice guys. Yeah. <laughs> I said, we're pretty nice guys. So, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. We had a great conversation earlier. Um, we will send a link, the, uh, the recording, we'll send the link of this recording to everybody who registered for this webinar so that you'll have access to it. Okay, so Matt, Dave, let's get started. Um, I think I'm gonna start with Matt. And in case people aren't familiar with True Essence, maybe can you start with a, a brief introduction about yourself and True Essence and what is flavor balancing? Um, sure, I'd, I'd love that. to. Okay, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Matt Rubin. I founded True Essence Foods in 2013, and we grew True Essence Foods to develop a number of uh, of flavor uh, of flavor balancing and um, dehydration technologies um, over the course of several years. As we've perfected this, we've grown from a research development focus to 
pilot testing and now we are uh, industrially producing many different types of spirits with a variety of customers and uh, companies. And it's a, and so we've uh, had a, a nice arc in growing with the community and we really appreciated out of each of the businesses that we've been working in, the, the distilled spirits community is a fantastic community to be a part of. Everyone, it's a it's one big family. So thank you so much for having us. Oh, no, we're, we're very thrilled. So let me ask you this. I know we, we talked about, so what is flavor balancing and, and you know, how does Terrescence and your team sort of make that impact in the industry? Sure. Uh, if we click through some of the slides, we can walk, we can even walk through some of that information. Or if you just say next slide, then, then Luis Next will... slides. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. So it, this gives a little bit of an overview of uh, Terrescence Foods. So if you look at our business with respect to the spirits industry, you say, what do we do? And the simple answer is that we balance off spec, uh, uh, balance off off spec flavors. So, you have something that doesn't quite meet expectations, and you need to, you know, return it back to inspect so that you can blend it back in. We get a lot of those calls. We help companies launch new products. So sometimes people say, "I like some of these ingredients, but I want it to be more premium than premium." And how do how can I get that extra mile of refinement? Um, in our product and really use this to get a, a, a great edge on um, the product. And then we enhance productivity. And this may be in helping to, uh, in the case of, of uh, uh, Sun King as an example, we are working with them to rapidly decrease the uh, resting time of uh, lager production. And so um, in, in the case, uh, so in each of these cases, we've worked with a variety of products. So we've worked with bourbons and RTD cocktails and neutral grain spirits, all the way down to uh, beers and uh, cannabis related products. Some of our the products that we've developed uh, in partnership with our customers um, are shown on this page and others we're just not allowed to talk about. So... <laughs> All the products shown on this page bear a true essence uh, mark on the back, and they've allowed us to to talk about them specifically. Okay, nice. So before, I know we're going to get into some science, which we're going to. Yeah, I would love to go through. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. But before we do that, because I want to make sure it's in, first of all, I'm just going to prop preface this by saying, please, when you talk about science, keep it in layman's terms for people like me. But <laughs> yep. before we get there, what was your inspiration? Like, why develop this? You know, what's and 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 what's the most exciting thing you've seen? throughout this, throughout your, throughout the history? Oh, that's a great, those are <laughs> two great questions. Um, let's start with the, the historical one. That's probably easier to answer. So we were fascinated with your natural response to fermented foods, whether it was fermented chocolate or a, a spirit. You, if you have a bite of dark chocolate, you, you take a bite and it sits in your mouth and you get this little, ugh, it's kind of that little, little kind of bite, and then it and it resolves at the end. And um, and we noticed that, and we appreciated it, and we wanted to understand the essence of where that bite comes from and the, the fermentation byproducts. And then we said, well, that's your body kind of telling you um, that that something's a little bit off, and you kind of get used to it as a consumer. And we said, well, what would the experience be like if it, if that wasn't there? And so how can we accentuate the peaks and soften the finishes? We went heads down into a bunch of science, which we're going to gloss over at a high level today. But <laughs> um, and, we, um, and we developed new technology that was non-additive mechanical technology that allowed us to really control that arc of flavor and expression with a spirit of vinegar or other fermented foods. Okay, fantastic. And, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's... That's the, the essence oh. of where it came from. Okay. Ooh, I, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the essence, but um, um, I didn't actually realize that you started with the uh, sort of idea of chocolate. I happen to love dark chocolate. So I'm thrilled that you started with that. Um, but so, okay. Now science. <laughs> yeah. So uh, next slide. Yeah. I think you got pressure fil filtration systems. Yeah. And so uh, actually work. Yeah. So the the very easy operator's version is you spray liquid in a top it goes out the bottom this is not a rectification step or a distillation step it is a transfer step and through that process we very carefully control the the environment that it's sprayed through and very control uh, the flow rates the pressure etc 
And that teases some of the things that naturally um, may take perfect, you know, amount of time and care in a Glen Karen glass to kind of resituate after you pour out a drink. We were able to naturally balance these things at a very high flow rates at industrial scale. And we can do this in in sample testing as small as 10 milliliters or 15 milliliters, so a single sip, all the way to industrial scale, we can process, uh, we're installing a system this fall that uh, processes 68,000 liters per hour. Wow. So that's, it's, that's it's it goes from very small scale to very big. Yeah. So. I'm glad you mentioned partner member Glenn Karen. So <laughs> I feel like I have to give you guys maybe a, a, a plug or a dollar every time you mention one of our partner members, but that's really okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. No, all okay. right. We had a, yeah. a I don't mean a dollar. Give you a membership. Just kidding. Um, gold, gold so, standard. Yeah. So what kinds of flavors are typically removed from the flavor balancing during the flavor balancing this is, process? This is one of the coolest parts. You asked about what, what projects really fascinate us. And maybe it's not the project specifically, but the ability for us to enable the master blender or the master brewer to have a tool that allows them to better express what they want out of a spirit. It's not a light switch where you say, I'm going to turn on flavor balancing or turn it off. It allows you to craft the experience. Do I want to bring out the sweetness in the product? Do I want to bring out the hops? Do I want to have a citrus forward? Do I want to increase or decrease the astringency? And you have the spectrum of experiences that once you find where you really like to be, it's incredibly consistent, industrially scalable. And so, so does the master blender slash distiller slash brewer do that themselves, or do they work with you on that? We yes, we partner. So tactically, they we we will start working with a with a, a potential partner, and they'll send us a couple bottles of product. We'll go back and forth, and we'll trade samples while we try to understand the inspiration of what they're trying to achieve with this product. Is, are they just trying to clean it up and reclaim product or are they trying to launch a new product and what, what in a perfect world, what would it be and, yeah. and where are they falling short? That partnership leads to a process where we can, um, we can go from sample testing to inline testing where we'll take and we'll have this machine basically hook up from one tank to the next. And it's an inline transfer step that goes between 15 to 300 gallons a minute. Wow. Um, so is this maybe a good time to bring in Dave and figure out like, is this where you- Yeah. Where so Dave yeah, we'll transition to Dave. Time. That's great. Uh, so <laughs> Dave has been one of our development partners. Dave's worn, um, you, you know, several hats and has been a great, you know, we're, if, if you're in a community, be part of a community. And Dave has been one of these great local partners that's mm -hmm. helped us for quite a while and trying to understand the the value proposition and, and uh, barriers to scale as we've grown. And we've also grown some really cool technology together. So I'll turn it to Dave. Hi everybody. My name is Dave Colt. I'm the co-founder of Sun King Brewing Company. Gosh, I started my adult alcohol beverage journey back in 1996 when I was uh, <laughs> first a, as an assistant brewer and then continued to grow from there. So uh, during our course of time at Sun King, we've added obviously beer as part of, you know, part of our focus. Uh, we've added some distillation and hearing Matt talk about some of these fun flavors that could be tuned and tweaked. As we all know, congeners are wonderful, but not all congeners are made equal and some of them need to be softened or picked up or not. And so, uh, you know, we've added spirit star portfolio and then started getting into hemp derived THC products as well. And you know, just kind of working through the, the steps in the process and how True Essence can either fine tune, make things more excellent and so on. Yeah. Cool. So it's just still working this through in my mind. Like you said, there, I mean, I happen to love bitter dark chocolate, but you're, maybe you're right. Maybe in the beginning I didn't like it. I've just gotten used to it. Yeah. So all tasted something that hasn't been quite right. So what's a before and after story about a product that you've helped reclaim using yeah, I mean, your specific product? Let's, so, let's start with the most basic. This product here is a great example of a, uh, this is a barkeep vodka. So this was a great example of a product. So, you, you know, the, the, from a distillation perspective, you say, well, we're going to distill it 10 times or 20 times or 50 times. And what you, you start hitting this asymptote where you're, where where you, you hit a wall where another distillation step doesn't necessarily help you anymore in achieving a higher quality product. And you say, so how can I get B 
beyond distillation and achieve the next level of refinement. And that's one of the challenges that we were brought when we had this Barkeep uh, vodka product. So they came to us and they said, we want to have a really uh, nice uh, product that um, that is a level of refinement and smoothness that we can't find in our current products. And we went with we worked with them directly uh, with the GNS and processed that. And when we proofed it, we found out that at 80 proof, it was so smooth that it was almost like scary how uh, <laughs> how little we could even detect it. So they decided to launch the product at 86 proof. And so they were able to do so not only with um, with a, a refined product, but very, very consistent industrial production. And that's one of the things that it's it's one thing to have something which is really refined. It's another thing to have it very reproducible at industrial scale. And that was a great product. We've also had uh, productivity enhancement products, and I'll, I'll probably turn it to Dave to talk about a, a Pachanga product. So one of the big issues for craft brewers especially, but we, as we know, lagers are the preferred style of beer worldwide. And so taking a look at a challenge with how much residence time it takes for a beer to fully lager out and get that sort of clean, crisp characteristic that is signature of those styles of beer. So during our discussions, you know, Matt and I were talking about that and we're like, hmm, what if we use flavor balancing? You know, once we pass, obviously, VDK and all of those kinds of wonderful things, um, then we're just holding up tank space. And so how can we turn tank space more quickly? Well, if we turn to flavor balancing, if there are any perceptible, which would be considered out of spec flavors, they would, they were mitigated in our benchtop trialing and up to a, a small scale at this point. So we're able to cut lagering times by two thirds, which, you know, brings it into spec with what ale fermentation is. So it allows us to turn tanks more quickly and we don't have to, you know, have those resources, that expensive capital resource of adding more tanks. Oh, so, so before we get to the uh, operational efficiency, since you mentioned capital, um, let me just ask, so I know you were talking, I mean, so you're over and you're talking about, you know, that you gave the example of um, you know, the lager and, and the brewing uh, example. Um, does that translate to the spirits industry as well, do you think? Or like what ways might that translate to the spirits industry? Is it a one-to-one, -one, you think, or with the same sort of... Um, I, you know, there's an art to making spirits that I don't want to, you know, we're, we're very careful in making sure that we can be a tool for helping to adjust flavor, but we are not, a t I, I, you know, whenever you're making a high claim, you need a high burden of proof and, and trying to short, make shortcuts in the spirit space was not our goal. Helping to provide industrial consistency was much more our goal. So one of the programs we have right now in the spirit space um, is, is, I wouldn't call it enhanced productivity, but one of the things that we've heard from uh, bourbon makers, as an example, was that there's this, there's this kind of these gap years between when I, when it, when it comes off the still, it tastes really nice and it's balanced and it's sweet. And if you've ever had, you know, great hearts coming off of a still before, it's just this delicious experience mm -hmm. and it goes into a barrel and it starts to age. And then you kind of go through this valley around years two, three, and four. And if it's a wheat bourbon, it may take five, six, seven years, and it takes a little bit longer to kind of age out and rest and find its happy place as a, as a bourbon barrel. And so working with uh, some customers to process new make to help provide a more consistent aging profile, where if they wanted to tap into that barrel in year three or four and not wait five or six, it may be more blendable. I, but, but that's, but there's no short circuit for, time ultimately in a traditional trade okay that's that's super helpful i mean i'm not a that makes sense i just but, you know in an, in an industry trying to yeah i, I want to make sure that we we pay respect to the industry that we're we're operating in and no that's that's helpful i i followed it um i would never be able to repeat this to anybody okay else. great <laughs> we have a recording else, so that's helpful here. yeah <laughs> um so so okay we talked about uh, Dave, you mentioned capital briefly, but maybe both of you, can you address, does this or how does this equipment maybe help improve operational efficiency or reduce waste in the production process? Is that possible? Well, if you have about? products, I apologize. I didn't mean to step on you, Amy. If, if you have 
products that are, you know, just outside of spec, as opposed to, you know, that potentially being a waste stream, then you can bring that back into balance and you are, you know, you're going to save those cogs right away from, from that standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But if we're looking at, again, for, for brewing application, other things where we have a long residency time in tanks, can we shorten that up and still get the same effect at the end, which, you know, we've done trialing triangle testing and all kinds of stuff. And our two week make versus six week has really um, shown that no one of our qualified testers can taste the difference between those products at this point. So I can make a claim because I'm using this technology, which Matt would not be able to, but, you know, we're, we're slowly growing this up to a, a larger scale size, but being able to, to, you know, not have to say, well, we're growing, we need more tanks. Well, do we need more tanks or, or can we use a tool yeah. to help our efficiency throughput and not have to have that capital outlay? I mean, a, a 60 barrel fermenter is, you know, coming up on say $40,000. Shoot. If I'm a lager brewer, I need three times as many as if I were an ale brewer. So I don't have to put that out there. So that's just direct from us. But. Yeah. And, and Amy, when we look at our relationships with our customers, they're usually multifaceted to, to Dave's point. So, um, you know, with reclamation and then in the industry. So once customers start building a relationship, they say they go through this phase of saying, oh, that's neat. And they say, oh, we've got these two projects, which we think are a fit. And then we say, hey, we could use it for this too. And for, for, you know, our, our relationship with Dave, we've now used this on how many products? Uh, three or four, five, six. Yep. Yeah. And we just did a reclamation a couple of weeks ago on a, we did ale program. And mm -hmm. so distilleries, when we do reclamation work where a, a distillery may say, I have five barrels, I have a hundred barrels, I have, you know, a thousand barrels of reclamation and we want to uh, get this. This is usually an opportunity for us to have a discrete project where we can do, you know, it's it's found money for the distillery and it's a great way for us to start building a, rec, uh, a relationship. If I could add on to the distilling space and, and the fermentation part of it, while it, you know, I mean, fermentation depends obviously on the spirit and all that kind of good stuff. But as we all know, you know, glycol systems go down or other experiences happen and you may get a fermentation that is just slightly off. Well, before it even goes through the distillation process, you can fine tune that mash, or fine tune that to bring it back into spec. So then heck you're on the road and you're not worried like, is this going to turn out? I just put all this time and capital into putting it into barrels if that's where it's headed to, so. Okay, there's a question in the chat. So um, let, me, let me get to that and then we can follow up. And I want to, I have a question in my mind about our craft distillers. But anyway, the question in the chat is, for spirits, at what stage do you plug in your flavor balancing machine process, distillation or bottling stage? For one of our brands, we distill at one location and bottle at another. Uh, it is either or. And mm -hmm. so it, it is anywhere between those. So we have units that are literally right next to bottling where we will do production and it goes into bottling um, just immediately adjacent and we have um, or we can process before it even goes to a barrel where the barrel may be sent to who knows where years down the road before it's bottled um, at at um, we we often find in um, while our new make program is in development and some of these enhanced productivity is in development, we often find the first application with many groups is closer to bottling mm -hmm. where they want to have much finer control over ultimately what the consumer experience is. So our tool allows them to really dial that in to make sure that the, there's a bottle to bottle consistency. And the closer you are to the bottling, usually the, the easier it is to control that spec. Okay. So I have a question then. This is a follow-up question to this. So in the, the slide that's still on the screen, you've got a, there's a picture, an image graphic of, of I guess, the technology, the piece of equipment. Yep. How large is like, like what's, how much space does that take up in? That's a four foot by four foot pallet. And oh. so that's something that you can, 
literally wheel around a factory and pop up the wheels and use and then pop them up and wheel it into a corner when it's not in use. And so if you're switching production lines or product lines, um, it's very easy to implement and then pull back. We have some groups that need incremental uh, or, um, uh, production assistance maybe once a quarter. And so we'll actually have a unit that travels to their facility. We run production for two days and we knock out one quarter's worth of production tank to tank very quickly, put it on a truck and take it back. <laughs> and so it's very, it's very easy. Um, our much larger scale system, um, our 68K series system is about 20 times oh. the production capacity um, with about uh, five to eight times the footprint. Okay. So that's super helpful because so so folks that are smaller distilleries that are maybe either newer or medium size all the way up through what we would consider our our board member or our director member companies, which are some of the largest global producers and suppliers. So you can maybe you have opportunities yep. that adjust for each of for both ends of the spectrum, right? Does that sound am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. So so all if they're producing, you know, some of our customers discuss quantities in bottles or gallons, and some of them discuss in tons of production per day. And, okay. and it, it really depends on the, <laughs> on, right. on the group on what they're trying to achieve. Um, and we have, uh, but, but we have turnkey solutions that are for all sizes. And so one more question related to this. So, you know, there are a number of folks who are starting off in this business who are, you know, want to create yep. their own spirit. Um, but they don't maybe have a distillery. Maybe yep. they're working with a contract distiller, or maybe they're just getting they're great getting brand neutral spirits. Is there a way? Do they can they come to you, or like is there? How this do you, is a great. This is a great example of that exact problem. So Field of Dreams. This is a really cool bourbon distillery. When I heard about the project, I got really excited. Um, they have the cord from the movie Field of Dreams. They somehow, oh. like a major league baseball player that said, I want to buy the most famous corn and then turn it into a bourbon. And we said, that sounds like fun. I want to be a part of that. And um, good movie uh, as a plug for the movie, if anyone's never seen it. Um, but this program, uh, this is uh, bottled at, the, they're effectively a virtual distillery. So they have a, a contract producers, a contract bottling facility, and um, they schedule production with us. We, um, we show up with operators in a truck and we knock out a, a production for their company. And, and it's actually been growing quite, uh, quite well. Okay, cool. All right. That's good to know. So just getting back to the sort of questions again, um, or sort of the earlier questions I had listed down. Um, so are there signs that a distillery or brewery might benefit from your equipment or are there specific red flags that folks, that distillers should look for in their production process that might get them thinking, oh, you know what, let me reach out to, to Matt? Um, that's a good question. So it, there are certain things that, that, we we've addressed a number of issues. There's certain things that we, that we can't address, or we at least have more difficulty addressing. Mm -hmm. So in the bourbon space, you know, the, you have barrels that may taste young or green that we've had great success with. We have barrels where we really want to provide that extra level of um, smoothness and refinement, especially for products that may be five-year-old bourbons or, or more where we're just really trying to round out the corners um, if it's a cheesy barrel or it's, uh, you know, it, if it has a, a fungal infection, those are things where we found are, are less um, uh, applicable. Okay. And so it looks like we have a, I'll, I'll let you question. feel the question. It looks like they're coming in on our side too. So yeah. Okay. There's another question. Um, in the example of contract manufacturing and your mobile, mobile service, I think specifically thinking internationally, um, do you offer mobile service internationally? Or would that not be cost effective? Uh, we be, we can build that into the cost structure. So there's nothing, it, it, you know, it, it really depends on the location. Uh, one of our largest uh, installations is international. In fact, a lot of our business is international as a company. Oh. Um, oh. Uh, particularly in Asia, we see growing uh, spirits markets. And um, we, we so we, we spend a lot of time building our domestic uh, uh, market and our footprint and our partnerships here. 
but we work with groups in Mexico. We work with groups in uh, the Caribbean. We we work with groups in Asia. And um, go ahead. Can I ask where in Asia? Would it happen to be Singapore? Uh, it is not. Well, oh. we no, we do not I'm have asking an installation this currently in to Singapore later. I think sometime in 2025. Uh, we don't currently have any installations in Singapore. Okay. Uh, we do have installations in China. Okay. Big markets there, of course. It, China is a wonderfully large market, and <laughs> and when you get into the details of international uh, logistics, um, sometimes customs can be a major barrier. Sometimes it's a non-issue, so it's a case by case. I'm happy to discuss some of those yeah. uh, details specifically with in, interested parties. Yeah. So that kind of dovetails into the next question. My next question on sort of return on investment. So I mean, obviously, there's some there's some projects where if you're going international and doing something really small, maybe may cost prohibitive or for, for whatever the reason. So what are the, what's the kind of return on investment can distilleries and brewers, I don't want to say expect, but maybe keep in mind or consider just from implementing your, your product? Your, your product? Um, it, it can be quite fast. So it really depends on what the application is. In reclamation, the system could pay for itself in a single reclamation project, which may, I mean, in in, the, in one example, we had, um, we, we recovered more than the whole value of the piece of the equipment in less than four hours during a reclamation program. And so it, if you look at the, on the extreme, you know, it's, it's found money where you start with something where you have to throw away and you have something that's now blendable and, that's a lot of cash that you can find very quickly and it justifies a sizable, it, it, it justifies an investment. And that was something that we did as a traveling reclamation. So we showed up with a truck and we processed it and we left. And so that can be very quick. Even large scale systems, the value of the product going through the system in, in less than an hour is more than the value of the equipment itself. And so it's, it, it, it can be very cost effective um, relative to its production capacity. Having programs that are big enough to keep the production capacity of a system going is probably more where the ROI conver or conversation goes. So, okay. so um, there is this, a question. Okay, go ahead. This fall in, in, in China, we're processing over a million proof gallons wow. just as a scale. Okay. Although I gotta say, there's a question in the chat, but I just wanna comment. I want that four hour return. <laughs> it was, it was pretty good. It was fun. It was, uh, yeah. And we could, we, I'm happy to discuss offline the details of that math and, and, but it was, uh, it, we, we did the, when we sat down with our financing, we were like, uh, that was, that was silly. So that's awesome. I know it's one of the outside, but still, that's great. Um, yeah. so the question in the chat is what kind of losses do you experience with the process? Um, very little. So, um, our, our first, production run, we actually took a single bourbon barrel, proofed it down, and then we processed it three different ways. So one was untouched, one was processed to be nice, warm on the palate and kind of your sit by the fire bourbon. And the third one was processed to be very buttery, smooth, kind of the, the bourbon for the sophisticated non-bourbon drinker that wants to drink bourbon, you know, kind of the, <laughs> the, the I don't know if that makes sense as, as classifications, <laughs> but and, and we said, okay, let's take a single barrel and let's split that and let's into three different production runs. Huh. You know, that means that we're charging the tank, running it, emptying the tank, and let's see how much do we lose. And we lost something like three bottles. And whether we're processing it for nine hours or a few days, it really becomes minimal pipe loss at that point. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. What, what wow. your, what's your experience? Yeah, David, what yeah, would it say? Yeah, I would say from running even even beer that is carrying a load of carbonation, you know, the loss really is simply in the piping to and from, you know, those fun corners and angles where you can't get mm. everything out. Okay, so that sounds, I mean, to me, to, minimal to a non, yeah, it sounds minimal to, to a non expert yeah. or non distiller, um, definitely a consumer, but non distiller. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's super helpful. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, so just looking at the future. So what are some of the innovations on the horizon for flavor balancing? Like, so what do you see happening in the company and equipment and maybe even trends over the next few years? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we've, we just formed a really uh, fun partnership with a, a, a flavor house down in Louisville called uh, Flavorman, where they came to us not only with some great 
development opportunities in terms of some of the key problems in the industry, whether that's uh, geosmin or sulfur, and how do we specifically remove some of these molecules? But they also came to us with a problem that says, in the space of RTD cocktails or in the space yeah. of kind of blending these spirits, a flavor house, they want to paint a really beautiful picture. And it's really hard to paint a picture when your canvas isn't white. And so they came to us, they said, I would love for you guys to help us to take some of these spirits, which are really industrial spirits, and clean up the base so that we just don't have to add as much sugar, we don't have to add as much flavoring, and it really helps the product shine, and it decreases the cost the same way, same level, and it helps us to be much more consistent. Uh, we met them um, kind of by chance as the other half of the technology that allowed this product to win uh, so we we work with them. They they were the flavor house on half of this, and we were the technology behind the GNS. And together, the combination helped us win double gold at San Francisco Spirits Competition. So we were Hi. we kind of and it wasn't until after that that we even had a phone call. And so we we <laughs> it was we were just like the two halves that glued together and made this really cool opportunity. So it, it, on the horizon, it it's looking at not flavor balancing of being the key driver for some of these um, uh, products moving forward, but how do we really clean up those bases to let the let the flavor masters create? Yeah. If I could add Please. to that, you know, just looking at um, water shortages, global, you know, climate change and all that kind of stuff, uh, there's going to be stresses on, you know, our grain supplies or whatever it is that you're using yeah. to produce your spirit. And so those global changes are going to create some challenges and maybe some things that are slightly out of spec beyond our control, but we got to keep the pipeline filled. Right. And so uh, we all want to use the best, highest quality grains and, and resources that we can, but that may not be something in the future. And so this could help maintain true to style down the road so that you don't see this sort of wandering flavor happen because of you know, those kinds of atmospheric pressures. Dave, I love that you brought in that sustainability angle, which is something that Discus works on. And that's, and that's something, you know, at the, one of the, in one of the papers um, in this week, they're talked about global water, water shortages and whatnot. So I'm glad you, super glad you tied that in. And then, you know, Matt, you also mentioned, was your example with the, the flavor man, I think it was, it's interesting yeah. because, so you all can work with, not only with brewers, distillers, people who are producing spirits, but also others that are in this sort of service support supply chain mm -hmm. to the industry. Um, yeah. That hadn't occurred to me. They often are kind of the crossroads of the, and the decision makers of sourcing industrial spirits and specking it in combination with their products. And so product launches may last two, you know, short runs, maybe a year to three years, long runs, maybe several years to decades, but it, they're constantly on that cutting edge. And so if we can provide a very consistent tool, it just helps them to be more successful a lot faster. That's great. I want to, I want to pause and see if there are any other questions, general questions. Um, and so while people are thinking of general questions before we close it out, I do want to make sure um, I, have a, I have a question because, you know, early in the beginning of the conversation, um, I don't remember if it was Matt or Dave, you mentioned cannabinoids, THC products, and those are of course on the horizon or here and on the horizon. Um, what are you guys? What are you guys seeing doing? Are you are you seeing doing anything in that in that in that area? Yeah, you know you mentioned uh, absolutely. Yeah, we've been. One. I apologize. We've been using True Essence to sort of flavor balance some of the uh, cannabinoids, uh, you know, up to and including some nano powders, where there might be a little bit more of a, a spicy or peppery character. So as people are entering into the space, that is not necessarily something or or something that would be a barrier for folks because of more of that sort of uh, cannabis, um, you know, dank character or, <laughs> or, or a spicy or pep pepperiness. And so allowing folks to, or getting that kind of out of the way, which again, goes back to reducing amount of sugar to sort of mask that allows us to have a cleaner canvas with which to operate, adding other flavors from flavor houses like Flavor Man. Ah, very interesting. Super great. And, you know, I, as a sugar fiend, 
<laughs> I'm happy, happy to hear there's like opportunities to reduce the amount of sugar. Um, this is very, very interesting, uh, Matt, Dave. I appreciate you taking the time to come talk to us. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So, but before we close, which will give everyone one last second to you sort of you know, raise your hand and put a question in the chat. Um, I just want to remind everyone of some upcoming Discus events, webinars, resources, um, and just say also this webinar and all past Discus webinars are available at distilledspirits.org slash events. The upcoming Ask the Expert webinars, um, we'll post details in the coming weeks, but um, gosh, November 6th, which is apparently is next week, <laughs> we have the future of barrels with Devil's Cask, and Devil's Cask was the winner of the 2024 Discus Innovation Award. Um, on November 15th, we'll have a webinar on distribution insights with Park Street companies. And December 2nd, um, we're going to be featuring the Strategic Sourcing Hub, which is a part of Black uh, Button Distilleries. Uh, and I also want to say that um, applications for the 2025 Discus Leadership Programs close November 15th. Those programs are, you know, kind of year-long programs for rising leaders or executive leaders. And there's also a women-specific, um, women-focused program as we try to encourage more women in, in the industry. But you can find more information um, about the different programs and apply at uh, discusacademy.com slash leadership certificate program. And there's also going to be a November 21st webinar on those programs just for folks to learn more. Um, and then lastly, uh, I mentioned, so Discus has an innovation showcase um, and we award at, at our at our conference every year, we, we, we name the winner, which the winner of the showcase gets a $10,000 check, which is fantastic. Um, but the uh, first session is, um, was it yesterday? And then, but the next session is November 6th, 1 to 2 p.m., and the finalists at that session will be Nouveau Sparkling Liqueur, Central Standard, and Dapper Darren's. And then we also have a showcase session um, on November 13 with um, Sacred Clubby Cocktails and Modern Cooperage. Uh, so that'll be super exciting. So those are free for anyone to you know, log into the webinar, listen to the presentations, see all these innovations that are coming up in our industry. And then I think you actually have an opportunity to vote for um, the finalists. So if you have any other questions about that, please feel free or anything that I've said or you want to connect with uh, with uh, Matt or with uh, Dave or learn more about Discus, please email membership at distilledspirits.org. And that concludes anything unless Matt, Dave, you have anything else, final words you want to say? Cheers. Happy Halloween. Oh. <laughs> <I'm jealous. laughs> I should have had you guys FedEx me something. All right. Well, that's great. Or UPS something. Um, anyway, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for our webinar today. Everyone may disconnect and you'll get a copy of the recording in a, next week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Happy Halloween, everyone. You too.